One of the most interesting aspects of international travel is the experience of how common products appear to cultural uses. Uh, for instance, consider the difference between the English love of tea, which is widely known, against our own national fascination with a cup of java. Um, that happens all the time in international contexts. And one of the things that our first speaker is going to look at is how the cell phone has come into African societies and uh, how they have adjusted to make that fit, adjusted in ways that we have not. Um, <coughs> our first speaker, Professor Marcus Watson, comes by his international experience the hard way. He was a Peace Corps volunteer for two years in rural South Africa. What is it they say about the Peace Corps? The toughest job you'll ever love? Okay, he can tell you about it. Uh, both sides of it, the toughest and how much he loves it. Uh, when Marcus returned from Africa, he began a series of graduate studies in anthropology that ultimately earned him a PhD from Cornell University in 2009. In 2010, the University of Wyoming hired him for a joint position in international studies and African American and diaspora studies, as well as some anthropology. Dr. Watson's research revolves around two key areas in which he regularly publishes. The first is an examination of the strengths and weaknesses of Western aid and aid workers in Africa. And the second studies the cultural and social change in African societies brought about by the introduction of new technology. Today, Marcus will combine those two interests by speaking to us on the question, are cell phones the new development workers? Reflections on an odd coincidence in sub-Saharan Africa. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you for that wonderful introduction. I'm happy to be here. Um, as you were told, I am an associate professor of anthropology at the University of Wyoming. Um, anthropology, here's the quick and short of it um, for this kind of talk. I go places and stay for long periods of time. And to the best of my ability, I try to learn the language. I try to eat the foods people eat, learn how they greet, argue, everything. Okay, so it's an immersive kind of uh, learning experience. Okay, so that's what I do as a cultural anthropologist. I've lived on the African continent for seven years of my life. I'm from Buffalo, New York, though, originally, born and raised. Okay, so m most of that time was spent in South Africa and Ghana, although I have visited 13 African countries. Okay, so that's anthropology. The kinds of things that I'll be talking about come from learning in that kind of way. Okay, okay so, I'll start by stating some things that I think are obvious. They're part of popular culture. For example, development workers are people who go around the world doing good things for people. Okay. Cell phones are devices that help us communicate more easily across great distances. Okay. What we wouldn't think of, I don't think, is that development workers and cell phones could be each other in some kind of a way. Much less that there's something colonial about both of them. Okay. So I'm not all the way to the point of making that argument but evidence from my two research projects is getting me to ask that question, right? And, and sort of getting me to say yes, but I'll be interested to, to hear what you think about it, right? I might steal some of you guys' good ideas and say, that's what it is, that's the relationship, okay? Um, <clears throat> all right, to be clear about what I, mean, what I mean when I say colonialism, some of you probably know this, that the African continent was politically walloped, colonized by European countries, right? And you know, you can go down the list, you can say um, uh, Guinea-Bissau over here was a, 
Portuguese colony. Guinea Conakry was a French. Uh, Sierra Leone was a British. And Liberia was controlled by the United States. Okay? You can go over here and say Sao Tome and Principe were Spanish colonies, as was Gabon. This was controlled by Germany. All right, so colonization of Africa definitely means that. Okay, it's not exactly what, what I mean, because colonization was multifaceted, and it came in a variety of forms to the African continent. And so another thing the colonization process tried to do was to convert non-Western people, in this case Africans, from a collectivist way of being, like we depend on each other, if you need food, I have it, if I need food, you'll give it to me, and so forth, to sort of the, the Western ideal of a person, you know, very individualized. You know, I'm responsible for myself, I'm free when I'm alone, right? So part of the colonization process, they called it civilizing people, okay? So that's sort of what I'm talking about here. And this happened in very particular ways on the African continent. So it started by Europeans, whether it was political authorities, missionaries, so forth, conservation workers, first establishing a, a kind of private space of their own, a foothold on the continent somewhere, right? A place they could call their own, they could retreat back to. Then what they would try to do often is get Africans to come into that space and work on them, right? Whether it was political ideology, teaching democracy, teaching Christianity, and so forth. In one sense or another, all of it was a route to teaching that ideal Western kind of individual person, okay? What they would also do, though, is be very careful about when they did leave their little bubble, their little island, their little retreat that they established with borders and fences and so forth, that they didn't engage the communities deeply, right, at all. In fact, they came up with all kinds of ways to sort of maneuver through African communities almost without being touched, right? So this whole thing I'm talking about is how, how do we reach out and touch without being touched back, right? That's the colonial genius that I'm talking about here. That's as abstract as I'll get, hopefully. You know, it'll get more concrete, okay? But let, let me go back to something that happened that made me think in the first place at all about development workers and cell phones in the same thought, in the same sentence. I'm in South Africa, and a guy named Sargent, he is a development worker, but we would call him a faith-based development worker. He was a missionary. So he was, his form of development was spreading Christianity, but it was also teaching the young congregants, the young converts, how to make bricks so that they could sell them and make money. Okay, so this was the kind of development worker he was. So anyway, but I, I walked into his mission station, all fenced in and, you know, private. Um, and we were talking for about a minute. This was back in 2005. His... His cell phone rang in his pocket. This is before smartphones. Okay, my kids like to say I was born in the 1900s. Um, so this is a long time ago, okay? Um, his cell phone rang, and he leaned to get it, and he stopped himself. He straightened himself back out, and he said to me, you were here first. So this fascinated me. It's a little thing. But the first thing I thought of was he, he, he's invoking this idea of lining up. Right, who's there first, right? And lining up itself, right, is based on kind of discrete spacing for each individual person. We're good at that, right? Um, we st when we stand in line, we do it. Um, if, if you have to leave the line for a quick minute, the person behind you sort of knows to you know, maintain the space. We even have ways of communicating, like, I'm not coming back, and then we kind of, we can not like, oh, it's okay, and then you, you move up into the next space, right? So there might be something colonial even about just the way we line up as opposed to South Africa where, especially in the villages, in the rural areas, people are more like, you know, like this over each other, right? So the idea of lining up is, is a cultural phenomenon, right? All right, so anyway, he's, he's invoking this cultural idea of lining up, but he's doing it across physical space and virtual space, 
right? So I'm in the physical space, and he cons you know, considered that I was there first. And the person calling in was, was second in line, right? So that fascinated me. But also, it fascinated me that there seemed to be some kind of relationship between sergeant and the cell phone, right? How do you have a relationship with a thing, right? But, but it was almost like it literally and figuratively called him, right? It was like, hey, ring, and he, and he went to get it. And then almost like he was upset by it, he was like, oh, come on, don't interrupt me, you know? There was something going on there, right, that made something like a cell phone seem more animated than just a little thing that people pick up and use as they see fit. Anyway, I filed that away, and I said, I want to study something like that later. In the meantime, Sargent was participating in my first research project on development in South Africa. Okay. Th this image here is supposed to sort of symbolize that reaching out to touch without being touched back, okay? the sort of colonial way of interacting. All right, so a little background on this first research project. I was a Peace Corps volunteer, 1997 to 1999, in the rural areas of uh, South Africa, specifically in the Limpopo province, all right, among Tsonga speakers. I decided to go from Peace Corps into a PhD in anthropology, as you know. I wanted to study something that had to do with development based on being this development worker myself, right? It, the whole thing fascinated me. It's life transforming. If any of you want to talk about Peace Corps, see me, okay? It's an incredible experience. So what I was noticing in my graduate studies was that development projects in Africa seem to fail all the time. And fail, if it's too strong a word, it's not too, too strong. You know, a lot of half successes, half failures, something ended up being done, but it wasn't what was intended, like all these kinds of stories. And so I started thinking, what, what, if, what if these things are failing, not because there's not enough money, right? Not because it's not well planned or they're not good people doing it, but because there's a problem with interpersonal relationships, right? My Peace Corps experience made me think of that because we were all sort of stumbled in interacting cross-culturally with people. So I ended up making those my, my research questions. I said, do aid workers and aid recipients like each other? Do they get along? And how does the quality of their relationship impact the delivery of development? Right. 24 development workers ended up participating in my research. Okay, so now we're fast forwarding to 2005 to 2007. They worked for one of three different organizations, a small, poorly funded, faith-based development project, that Sargent, okay, I mentioned him. The second was a well-funded um, HIV AIDS assistance project. Okay, it was called Koresanani, which means uh, working together in Tsonga. And that was well-funded by Catholic Relief Services and then some of the participants were Peace Corps volunteers. Right? So I drew an analytic circle around their face-to-face -face interactions with Tsonga speakers and Petty speakers, who both live in the Limpopo province here. And I noted everything I could about how they were interacting. Not only the words that they were saying, but the gestures, right? signs of comfort and discomfort. Right. I noted all that with other research uh, assistance from these villages. Okay. And definite patterns emerged. And the patterns basically amounted to there are some serious problems in these cross-cultural relationships, which I'm going to share with you uh, through the example of Sargent. So I'm going to expand on him a little bit. Okay? But what I say about him in the broadest outlines apply to all of these development workers. So Sargent is an Afrikaner, meaning he is a white native of South Africa. He's from Cape Town, way down here. He 
decided after apartheid, apartheid was this big racist system in South Africa. It finally ended in 1994, and when that ended, everyone could sort of feel like, hey, let's all go to the different corners of our country and meet each other. We weren't able to before. Like, law stopped us, okay? So him being a good guy, I think if he was sitting here, we would like him. We might even see some of ourselves in him, okay? He decides he wants to go to the rural areas of uh, petty speaking, P-E-D-I, uh, parts of South Africa, and missionize, okay? And, and like I said, also teach people brick making, little kids, so that they can grow up and, and do business. He used to talk, he told me, he used to talk about he wanted to walk with people the way Jesus had done, right? Again, getting at how he's a good person. Like he, he wanted to you know, be with in, black people, right? And you weren't allowed to be. Um, that went south pretty quick. Okay. Unlike some of the other development workers who I studied, he actually went a step further than most and lived with a host family. That's really getting in there, in a village. Okay. This is what a village could look like in Limpopo. Okay. All right, so he's living with the family. He's quickly unnerved, annoyed, by some of the things the family's doing. Like when he goes out to missionize and work, he comes home to find they've gone into his room, which he had locked. But they found a way in or had a key or something. They got in and they were, and then, and then when he'd go out, he would see his clothes all washed and hung up on a line and his shoes cleaner than they've ever been since he bought them, like, you know, sitting out here. He, he, his cultural response wasn't to be thankful, right? He felt violated, like, you can't go in my room. I created this tiny little space in this whole godforsaken country. It's the only place that's mine, is his feeling, right? And you went in there. So what they're doing, of course, is in this kind of collectivist culture, they're saying, for me to be your mother, or for me to be your sister, because it's women who did this kind of thing, I have to wash your things. That's how I make a brother you know, out of you and a, you know, a mother or, or a sister out of myself. He didn't see it that way. Right? He just said, stop violating my private space. And so he, you know, first he double locks his doors more. Um, you know, he's getting annoyed that people are always saying, come and eat, which is another thing you do you know, in this kind of culture. Come and eat, come and eat. I don't want to eat. I'm just, I had a hard day. I want to go home. You know? So finally, he, he moves out because an opportunity arose. He had a, an elderly, quote unquote, friend deeper in the village who had his own compound, but also owned, or not owned, but controlled another piece of land and there was nothing on it. So he s went to the guy and said, can I please use this land so I can build my own home slash mission, mission church? And the guy said yes, but the guy did it in what's called a usufruct basis in anthropology. It basically means you don't own it, you're just sort of a caretaker. And I'm gonna give it to you, but not to own, but just you can use it, and when you're done, you know, someone else will use it. So very quickly, what Sargent did was somehow coerce this guy into saying, can I convert this into private property? And you kind of don't say no to a foreigner, especially if it's a white person. There's sort of a racial hierarchy of value that people follow. And so they go to the chief, and the chief signs the paper. Now it's his property. The next thing he does, he gets the, the young converts to like mass manual labor to build this huge fence around the place. Okay, so when I told you that story, that had already been done, because I walked in, there was a huge fence, right? Um, so they do that. And he creates this little enclave. And he's pretty much alone. He creates very strict um, entering rules that the converts complained to me about, but they wouldn't say to him. And then he wouldn't engage socially in the community, right? So there were births of kids. He wouldn't go. And they talked, but they, people told me about it. They wouldn't tell him. But I was there to, to do research, right? Um, he would get in his car and drive down the road, and people would complain. He just waves out the window. He doesn't stop. In this kind of place, you stop and greet. He would go on what he called getaway rides on his motorcycle. He would just tear up into the mountains and just feel free. You know, 
Um, if we look even closer at his everyday body conduct, we might have predicted he would have made these kinds of decisions and felt these kind of ways. Because his body was expert, without him thinking about it, of course, his body was expert at doing a colonial thing, which is precisely keeping people away, right? So that if he wanted to engage them and work on them, he could. So he, would, he had a very stiff body, and, and the young converts would talk to me about that. He, he would shake hands really, really hard, sometimes buckling their knuckles. You know, there was a case where they had t some of these kids would tell me about it, and then I would see it happening, and they would look over at me like, you know, <laughs> he's buckling my knuckles, right? Um, he would, he would uh, unflinching eye contact, you know, he would almost, you know, embarrass the, the you know, they're kids like 18 to 22, let's say. You know, they would kind of like, they wouldn't know what to do when he was staring at them like that. We kind of just do it because it shows respect and even the hard handshake, you know, show that you're there, you know. Um, but for them, you know, they wanted to kind of with the eye contact, like, what are you doing? Are you there? You know, um, right? He, he would always square people up, right? He had this, you know, his body already sort of said, this is what I'm going to do. I have my space. This is me. That's you, right? Which doesn't work very well across a collectivist culture, right? Where body behavior is much more like this. All right, so let's move on to cell phones now. In Ghana, which is right here, yellow part right there, all right, I did research among bully speakers here. Their bodies didn't work like sergeants at all. Right? Again, different from South Africa in so many ways, but some values are the same, like collectivist, right? depending on each other, reciprocity, things like that. And their body conduct, as I'll you know, talk about later, reflected that value. Okay? So, all right. Oh, sure. Sorry. All right, so this can be called the Buluk kingdom, the Bulsa people, the Buli language. Okay. There are 100,000, roughly, Buli speakers in the Upper East region of Ghana. They live in almost savanna-like conditions. Okay. Their economy is based on family, extended family compounds, mostly rural, mostly villages. There are some towns. And the families grow things like millet and groundnuts, which we call peanuts, okay, and sorghum. Politically, there's, it's a kingdom, okay, for one. But it's also part of Ghana's democratic kind of system. So they've also made a district out of it. It's both. And it just you know, kind of flips one way or the other, depending on the, the situation. This is, again, socially and culturally super collectivist. Okay? Maybe even more thickly so than here. This is the kind of place where there's always food to eat. You go to a neighbor's house, they're giving you food. If, if a child is sort of embarrassed and says, I've eaten, but a mother you know, happens to be maybe older or she, she can really see, she'll say, no, you haven't. Come and eat. Right? There's always, always food to eat. It's the kind of place where you stop and greet everybody. Right? It's the kind of place where you're, you don't walk away alone or they'll think you're cuckoo. Like, who in their right mind would want to be alone is the, question, the rhetorical question they would, they would ask. Um, they believe that that kind of interdependence is not only between living beings, but between living beings and the deceased, ancestors. All right? In almost every household in Buluk, there is a shrine, probably several. But there's a main shrine that connects all the way to the king's shrine. And his has the power that, that brings life to all of them. Okay, just super interconnected collectivists, a really cool place, okay? Um, their body behaviors, again, are collectivists. So um, 
you know, if people see each other, they might give each other a kind of a soft hug, not the, not the big man hug thing, right? Where it's like, hey, you here, you there? Yeah, you know, it's just, you know, soft. They, they might um, go from there to drop their hands and interlink fingers, right? And, and sort of talk like that the whole time at an angled kind of position. Eye contact is situational. It's kind of ebbs and flows with the, with the flow of the emotions, you know, underlying a conversation. All right, so gestures are, are very, very different. All right, so now, how much time do I have? Um, 20 minutes. 20 minutes? Oh, okay. Including the 10 minutes of question and answer. Okay. All right, so let me tell you a little bit about my findings when it comes to the cell phone thing in this kind of place. All right, so one guy, his name is Adoen. All the names start with A here because that means you're a human being. If you have a name that doesn't start with an A, you're a thing. It's just the way the language goes. You can ask me about that later. Um, so his name is Adwin. Born and raised in Buluk, but traveled to Germany, and he'd been there for 10 years or so. He was a high school teacher. But he, he came back to visit, and I was there. We were standing on the porch of his sort of middle class uh, home that was in one of the three towns that are part of Baluk. And a research assistant and I are talking to him, or, and we're kind of, by this time we know him very well. It's part of anthropology. It's almost like we're good friends, brothers, sisters, you know. So it, it's hard for him to tell, I would think, when we're ever really talking about my research. We're just sort of talking, right? But we do venture on the subject of cell phones. And he's saying, you know, cell phones, you know, they help me, you know, communicate with my son in Germany. Um, and he, he pointed to his brother who was standing in the distance on a phone talking to what he called his boy in Accra, Ghana, which is the capital down here. Okay, boy, boy in this case means sort of a live-in servant in his house that was down in Accra, and he was talking to him. And he said, like, see, he can talk to him. And we were sort of saying, yeah, but to talk to him, doesn't he have to kind of be away from us? And he was like, no, he's just you know, doing business. And after a few minutes, his phone rang. And he gestured with this like, wait a minute finger. And he, and he walked off. It was, and he came back. It was his son from Germany. He had to take the call. And he came back a little bit embarrassed. You know, and he was saying, OK, I get it. The, the call kind of calls you away. I was like, yeah, that's good. I, we ended up uh, uh, titling a, an article that. The call kind of calls you away. All right, another situation, uh, NDC. All right, I'm sitting, everything in Ghana is outside. You know how we're kind of inside, right? But the markets, life, there's just people everywhere all the time. You're always in everybody's business. Again, if you're inside, it's like, what's wrong with you? All right, so the same is true for this restaurant we were at. All the seats are outside, and it's really hot too, right? And we're sitting there, about four of us, and on DC's one of them. His phone rings, and at the first ring, he's, he kind of leans and is reaching for the phone. By the second ring, he's standing up, taking it out of his pocket, and by the third ring, he's close to the roadside, okay? There's people all over the place, well, there's a town, and, he, and he's on the phone. There were two people who passed, and I'm kind of looking at this, because this is what I'm here for, right? I'm like, you know, what's going on? Two people passed and greeted him. He was oblivious. He had no clue that they were you know, greeting, because he was just consumed in the, in the phone conversation. A lot of this is familiar. It's just that it's happening in a collectivist place, right? where being alone like this is, is bad. right? It's a bad look. All right, so that was another situation. Um, the last person, Asibi, right, Asibi. So my research assistants and I, from where we were staying, we would see every day this throng of students, high school students, walking from their high school to the main town. And we noticed that it happened in a, in a certain kind of way. There were just a few people on phones, but whoever was on phones walking to town, there was no one around them. Everyone else was, who was just talking to each other, they were in big groups, and they were talking and playing games that boys and girls play, I guess, you know. Um, but there was, there was almost like a, 
a little comfort zone that people, you know, gave people on cell phones. So, but one time, we saw someone, we, we happened to catch someone, uh, a Sibi, who was in one of the groups of people talking, um, get a text message, and she peeled off. She peeled off to look at it. She, she slowed down to a halt. She turned around. She waved to her friend who was way back there, who had texted her. And so we could see that now she's waiting for her friend. Okay, so she, she does turn and keep walking, but super, super slowly. Okay, and she's still, I think, maybe texting her or something. As the friend gets closer, she, she's now calling someone. She's on the phone. Her friend taps her on the shoulder to basically say, let's go. So then they start walking faster. She's still on the phone. Her friend calls someone, and they're both talking on the phone with other people as they walk to town. So thanks to my research assistants who are from there, right, I had the credibility to the next day say, hey, hey, when I, we saw her, can you talk to us about something? And so we did, and we just sort of you know, asked her, you know, we cl clearly you wanted you know, to wait for your friend. She said, yeah, you have to wait for your friend. And I said, but then you were on your, your phone. You know, why didn't you talk to her? So I was talking, I was seeing how another friend was doing. So why don't you ask how she's doing? It was just sort of like that, and she just said, well, you know, it's fun to be on phones. So I don't have much more to say, except in those phone examples, what I'm noticing is the call kind of calls you away, right? calls you to a space away from sort of the thick social context of African collectivist relations, right? Similar to how Sargent, right, and, and other peace, I mean, other uh, volunteers, um, you know, created that safe zone for themselves. So it kind of called them away. But more than that, are these cell phones changing specific body behaviors and gestures, right? So as far as I know, as far as my research tells me, there was no such thing as the wait a minute finger. It appears new, right? And does using cell phones help to produce that finger? Um, the same thing with this, with this uh, uh, prayer kind of thing. I, I call it um, what a Sibi was doing, a prayer kind of thing, because she looks like this when she's texting on the phone, right? And that's a very, like, insular, closed-off kind of posture. And I look for that thing happening anywhere else in Buluk, and I don't see it, right? So is it changing? Is, is our cell phones not only calling people away, but calling people to start behaving more like Sargent, right? Phone call by phone call. So that's why I get to this idea, you know, our development workers and cell phones, both not just agents of change, but colonial agents of change. So that's my presentation. What's happening and what he's doing? He couldn't 100% modify his approach, but I guess it would depend on the individual person, wouldn't it? I, I know for myself, mm -hmm. body space, mm -hmm. I was just blown away in Africa. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And one of the things I remember walking into the airport in in London when we landed was, oh God, <laughs> you know? But I'm thinking, was he? Totally unaware of what was happening and then the cultural differences in that. Do you do you have a feel for that? Oh, I know. He was totally unaware. He was totally unaware. But there are two questions. So that's now a second kind of thing to talk about. The first one is sort of how, how conscious are people of doing this kind of thing? And obviously not. But you can be made conscious the way we all sort of just were if you hadn't thought about this before. Then the question is, how much can I ride that consciousness to change my behavior? Right. And I think it would be hard, but like you said, different individuals can probably pull it off, you know, better and worse. But there were other development workers, again, all good hearted people, okay, who would do things like realize if you eat with people communally with your hands, that gives you some credibility. And I'm a good person. I want to do this. You know, I want to show people. And so there was one guy, uh, John, he, he did that. He, he, he ate, all right, the, the meal is 
if you can imagine mashed potatoes, big mound of it, you know, like this big, and multiple people are eating in it, right? Um, so he would do that a couple times. Then the people he was eating with, who were like his assistants, you know, doing what he was doing, they would tell me, again, because I'm researching and I'm, I'm, I'm telling people, if you tell me something, I'm not going to tell anybody else. And that was one reason I did, didn't approach him and say, come on, man, you know. Um, but they would say, he eats only to the point where no one else has touched and then stops. So that, that was, that's an, ex uh, an example of how far his consciousness could get him to enact what he thought people were doing. And then they would say, does he think we're sick or we're dirty or something? You know, because in this kind of culture, they also have things about hygiene. But they do it like this. If you're clean, you eat with people. If you're dirty or sick, go, okay, fine, go over there and eat with a big wooden spoon if you're in the village. You know, so you can imagine people watching our TV shows, you know, American, and saying, God, are these people all sick or what's going on the way they're eating, right? Um, yeah, so that's a great question it needs to be answered you know if through research at some point um the second thing that you were kind of saying at the end <laughs> anybody remember the second about the space well you sort of i think you sort of wish them together oh. one how conscious are they yeah. of it and two can they change it or not I, i'm just wondering about the orientation for some of these folks um, and I, I know I, I would say our Peace Corps orientation was very inadequate sure. as far as culture right. and that. Hopefully they've improved it since I was in, but... Um, Where were you a volunteer? In Swaziland. Oh, Swaziland. Yeah, wonderful place. Mm -hmm. it was a great experience too, but that was a long, long time ago. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I'm just thinking a, a little introduction like you've done, you know, a little bit of what you can do with your body language and the customs and that mm -hmm. sort of thing um, would be very helpful for some of these development workers. And I don't know whether USAID and that kind of people get that sort of training or not. I, that would be a place to go sure. with your... <coughs> I, I, I'll do another question too. How, how many people, when were you in Ghana and how many people have cell phones at that point? What percentage of the population you want to estimate? Um, I'm married to Ghana, by the way. My wife is from Buluk, okay? So um, I've been, we met in 2000, and actually 1999, but she lived in Accra. But I've, I've been doing studies in Buluk for, since 2012, okay? Cell phones got to Ghana in 2000 or 2001. When I was there in 2012, the early years, 2012 to 2014, it was mostly men who had cell phones, though not all. But many, many, many more people, men and women, had SIM cards. And so everyone would carry these things. They'd, they'd kind of you know, wrap it up in paper so it's a little bigger, it won't get lost. And when they get, got to a, a family member or a friend who had a phone, they would say, hey, can I use your phone for a minute? And they'd stick their SIM card in there and do what they have to do. And I, yeah. But now I think it's, it's, it might be 85%. Cell phones have become much cheaper now. When my sister-in-law came, um, to, she's in Laramie, uh, Wyoming now. When she came and went to Walmart looking for phones, she couldn't find one sophisticated enough. She complained about that. Like, I, don't, I don't even know what that means. But. Oh, yes. Uh, how much urbanization, uh, interaction with urban areas affecting behaviors that you're seeing that aren't related to the use of cell phones? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I don't know if everyone heard that, but you know, I, I described in my talk some of the, the new kinds of behaviors. And the question is, you know, it could be, okay, I was saying, it, kind of linking it to cell phones, but it could be cell phones and other things people are learning in urban environments. It could be the urban environments and not the cell phones, right? Those are, are great questions. Uh, the, the, there isn't a, a real dividing line like we might think of between rural and, and urban. 
in most African settings. Mostly because if you live in the booming city of Accra, you're planning to be buried back in the homeland, back in the rural areas. People are always moving back and forth. Right? So definitely there's, in, you know, there's, there's a possibility of influence. So that's definitely true. Whether I can slice that, I'm not sure. But it's a good question. It's good to, to keep in mind. My hypothesis would be that maybe gestures that are being learned in urban areas and gestures that cell phones require just to be used, are, they might be related in some significant way. Um, how, so how is the internet? I mean, do you consider that to be part of it, or is that not as common? No. The end, yeah, pe people access the internet through their phones. So it's there. It's all over the, the, the country. But here, maybe you're getting at this. It doesn't always work well. It does not always work well. And it's really frustrating. The electricity also doesn't work well. They have a, a name for it. It's called Dunso. Every, if you say Dunso in Ghana, it means the lights are out. Right? And when the lights are out, Harder to use. Because I, I still think they use sub, subterranean cables um, as opposed to, they probably have satellite too, but I think they rely on subterranean cables mostly. Um, yeah, so that's yeah, interesting, interesting question. Do you think some of this cultural change can be caused by a loss of them being introduced to Western culture like movies and things like YouTube? Yeah, I think that's kind of what I'm getting at. That's, that's where it's, it's coming from. Um, there's a saying in communication study that uh, the, the medium is the message. The medium is the message. So if you think about TV, we're sitting there watching TV, and you know, our parents, or if we are parents, we might do this, you know, might say, I want you to watch this show, not that show. This one's too violent. This one has too much explicit whatever, right? But, but this, this kind of phrase says, what's really important isn't even the content. It's the fact that we are retraining ourselves to sit down and stare at a box on the wall, right? And pay less attention to the, you know, to the person next to us. Even to the point where mom's calling three, four, five times, like, oh, what, you know? If you even did go, you know, some of us probably just intentionally ignore her. Don't do that. That's not good. Um, yeah, so I, I, yeah, I think a, a wider, you know, study would, would show that, um, you know, cell phones, there's something similar about cell phones and looking and TV and looking or a movie and looking, even reading, right? We kind of, we, we do things that in traditional Africa, you know, would, would have been just totally foreign, which is sitting down, staring at something and not talking to anybody else. So can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. um, are they trying to, the phone among the, among the movies, the TV, et cetera, the phone is the only one that you're actually having a two-way communication with. So do you think that some of the body <coughs> language is trying to make the phone behave like a person? In other words, yeah. You know, if you think, I mean, mm -hmm. you did this thing with uh, the, the missionary, yeah. how he lines up his body and, mm -hmm. you know, places the person in a way that he then communicates with them, mm -hmm. or he controls the communication. I'm mm -hmm. wondering if they're sort of doing something vaguely similar with, with the phone, trying to make it behave, you know, granting the phone the rights of the person. Mm -hmm. I think so. I mean, people will talk about, you know, I have her in my pocket, you know, things like that. So they do animate the phone. But they, they also, a lot of people in Buluk are animated when they're on the phone. Like you would think they're almost going to jump through it. And that struck me as very different, you know, than our sort of delicate, dainty ways of holding the phone. People are, they're out in the middle of the street. The arms are flailing and the voice is loud, you know. And it's like they just want to jump through and they, they, they almost want to bring the person closer. But I mean, one, one of the things that is similar about all these kinds of devices is for them to be used properly, the users have to first be really, really far away from each other. 
Like that's the starting point. First be really far away and then, then communicate. Um, the closest thing you have to something like that in traditional Buluk society is called weak, W-I-I-K, weak. And this is, you, you climb up on the roof of one of these mud structures, like this, maybe, and, or like this here. This is Buluk here. And you shout a message, you know, 200 yards. The, the sound carries here, you know, 200 yards to the next compound. The person hears, they climb up on their roof, they shout it to the next person. Whole, messages throughout the whole kingdom have been communicated this way. But still, the person's close enough to hear, right? So introducing technologies that require for them to be used properly, that you have to first be really, really far away, whether it's radio, um, TV, right, things like that is, it's a cross-cultural relationship in itself. It's, just, it's between human beings and technologies, right? That's what I'm studying. That's what I'm interested in. Could you? Could you do just a quick little geographical orientation? Mm -hmm. I picture that whole West Coast down to Namibia about being all jungle. I was shocked when mm -hmm. you said that there's savanna up in sure. northern Ghana. Sure. It doesn't go question. very far inland. Would that be? The, the, what we call jungles in our movies, rainforests, yeah. right, is 5% of the African landscape, right? So hardly any. And it creeps along the coast. It goes a little bit deep into the continent. It ends about right here. And so if you looked at a geographic map um, or typographical map of Africa, you, it, it runs in parallel lines. So you start with rainforest, if you're just talking about the West Coast. Rainforest at the, at the coast. Then you have dry um, forest lands as you move up, up north. By the time you get to the north of Ghana where I study, it's like steppe. It's, it's similar to here, except super, super hot all the time. Right? It's almost, it, it almost feels deserty. Right? As you move up into Burkina Faso, right, you're getting to real savanna, and then you're getting to the Sahara Desert up here. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Thank you.